Today we have Professor Milin Tambe uh, at the Public Affairs Center campus and uh, his great initiative of AI for social good is what he's leading at uh, the Harvard University as well. I don't need to you know, drop your whole uh, list of credentials because it speak, your work speaks for itself. Um, my first question is how do we see these two worlds converging? Public Affairs Center is a not-for-profit think tank. Um, and, we, uh, and we work uh, in diverse areas connected to governance uh, and within it different sectors and the artificial intelligence world. So how do you see these two worlds converging towards making lives better you know, on the ground? So how do you see this? This is such a wonderful question and I guess as we were uh, just discussing it just seems like those are so complimentary because uh, we come from the world of AI, we are AI researchers and our focus is AI for society benefit. But we don't have the expertise in, in social work, in public health, which is what your focus is on. And so it's so complementary. And so, uh, so I see a lot of synergies here in working together. Just today I read an article that, um, that's been published, I think, uh, Northwestern, on um, how AI and social sciences are drifting apart. Mm. And you know, this is a counterpoint uh, today, right? That uh, in fact, AI and so, you know social work, AI and public health, AI and social organization, you know, non-profit organization engaged in this sort of issues of governance, public health, and so forth. And we can we can really work together. So I, I feel a lot of synergy here. Okay, um, we we were discussing earlier your work. I mean, the great diverse kind of uh, you know areas that you worked from conservation to security and now you're getting into public health even in India. Uh, the key question that, uh, you know, that came up in our discussion was also the removal of the bias. First of all, the acceptance that there is bias and in that, um, now we put that scenario in an Indian situation where even data in that sense, in terms of even accessing data is limited because not everything is digitized, not everything is known. How do you function in this kind of, you know, multi-level uh, uh, um, areas where errors can happen? That's right. So I guess um, our specialization is AI for societal benefit, particularly for low resource communities. Mm -hmm. And so we are very uh, involved with domains where there is inadequate data, such as uh, the work we've done with homeless youth in Los Angeles. The work we're doing with tuberculosis uh, patients here, that data is also, you know, there's a lot of uh, complications in that data as well. So we are very used to the idea that the data is not clean, it's not uh, something that's plentiful, and that we have to work with sparse data and somehow actively collect data to correct for mistakes, for biases, and so forth. So that's something that uh, we're very used to. So with respect to collection of data, when there is uh, limited data and so on, that's something we feel is a fantastic challenge. And this is actually one of the things that I have been trying to push within our community. When we go to AI, when we try to push for AI for social, social uh, good, we can't wait in our labs and say that, okay, but, you know, give me data, then I'll do some social good. No, no, we have to go out in the community. We have to understand what are the problems, where is, you know, what kind of data is actually available, what can we realistically do and then try and figure out clever ways of teasing out that data that we need. As to the problem of uh, bias, that is a, such an important problem. And it is a, it's a problem that has to be very carefully addressed. Um, certainly, you know, in the United States, for example, I'm familiar with uh, problems that are thought about in terms of predictive policy. Mm -hmm. So that, that uh, predictive policing algorithms sometimes tend to target People in minority, you know, minorities more than the majority and so on and so forth because the policing was done more uh, in those areas. So the data comes out biased and then the predictions are all biased. And this is a major issue that we need to correct. And so that's something that we are beginning to do in our work as it relates to public health. But this is something where um, we would need to really engage with the community, really understand um, where hidden biases might have been there in the first place so that we can try and understand that. And one thing that needs to happen is that these AI programs that we develop need to be transparent about what inferences they're drawing from what data and explaining their own reason. So if they're able to say, look, the reason I concluded 
somebody is a high risk patient, for example, is because some factors that I look into account. And you can look at those factors and say, is this something that we are comfortable with? Uh, and if, uh, if it turns out to be a biased uh, prediction, then we, we can come back and say, okay, there's some, you know, we don't want the program to be making these predictions. This is a very important future research area for us, for the AI field as a whole, and something that the community as a whole is really battling. Okay. Now, you've, uh, you've studied here, you worked here, you did a lot of your uh, research work and your actual work in AI in the States. And in, when you come back to India and you see a lot of, you know, I mean, I'm sure it's a, you know, all the comparisons keep happening in terms of. This could have been done better, this could have been done better. In here, I could have you know, put in one, uh, you know, something to change things. When you think of you know, all these aspects um, in a developing country like India, and you go to the departments, and you've said you've had a lot of these discussions with a lot of people in the Indian audience, but not much has fructified. So, how do you keep, still keep at it? You know? Because I'm sure you have the same battles as you have right now in India. When, when you were dealing with, with the police department back home, yes, right? That's right, that's right. So that's how right. do you keep, and keep telling them that it's not just a machine, it can actually help you make your life better. So how do you keep doing that? That's right, that's right. And so I think, um, you know, the, I'll just describe to you the first meeting I had at Los Angeles airport when we started this work uh, with the police department. There, you know, you can imagine a sea of police officers and then two AI researchers, or three AI researchers explaining to them, here's what AI can do for you. And the police saying, okay, we are, you know, we have dozens of experience, dozens of years of experience. And how can an AI program teach us something that we don't know? Okay. And so it took us time to kind of build up trust to show them, you know, how AI can augment their intuition. And so we were working with them and bringing them in from the ground floor up so that when the program was built, it was their program, it was not just our program. And once they became advocates for the program, then you know it was able to be used, and, and there was a lot more uh, success that followed. Here we haven't had as much success, I believe, because we aren't able to keep coming back, like at the LA airport or something. I could keep going back, keep going back, talking to them with the different Coast Guard officers, or even with wildlife conservation. I actually went to Uganda, spent some time there in the, the forest there and so forth with the talking to Wildlife Conservation Society. We've patrolled with people in Cambodia, in Malaysia and so on. So this sort of trust building exercise is something that we have not yet been able to do here. But I'm hopeful that with this partnership that we have, the ability for me now to be able to station, be stationed in Bangalore, that I will be able to spend that time and then build up partnerships. I must say that, um, you know, I look at the different IITs, the students that I interact with, and I'm just blown away by the potential that is here. And this is, you know, there's so much good that AI, with, we can do with AI here. And, how, you know, the students are eager, they're very interested in doing it. And I think um, with a center such as yours, if you are able to point out to them, look, you know, here's some partnerships that we can have, here's some problems we can solve, I'm sure we can direct these uh, students to make advances in the social center. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, um, and this is because of the way AI publications work and so on. People focus more on more abstract problems. Um, and I think it is perhaps on us as AI researchers, perhaps someone new as social, you know, in the social sector, to point out to these young minds, to these students, that look, you know, there are very important problems that are very directly beneficial to society. And that these can be important topics for PhD thesis work, for research work. And uh, that may also help us kind of see AI being used, you know, more broadly in terms of social good here. Okay. Actually, my final question. Uh, I've been reading a lot because I know that I needed to speak to you and I needed to be here when you were presenting. So, um, I've been reading a lot in terms of how AI is uh, being recognized, or at least uh, this was a paper that was uh, written for the World Economic Forum, uh, the website blog, actually, um, by a proponent of, the, uh, of AI. And uh, he basically writes about how even AI needs to recognize that it is a gendered space. So, I just wanted to know your views on that. No, it is um, uh, definitely there's a bias in terms of who is doing AI. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, who's actually building these AI programs and what is going on. 
personally in my lab, um, you know, I've tried to maintain a gender balance between, so it's equal numbers of uh, men and women as much as I can. Um, but yeah, it, 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 I mean, it's biased in various ways. I mean, um, not only in terms of um, gender, race, uh, also, you know, there's definitely a gap there. And so we need to bring AI to those who have not benefited from it. We need to educate uh, a different cadre of people who can come in and populate the AI space and bring their problems to the table so that we can actually have people looking at their problems. Because if we only bring in the people from the 1% uh, of the population to do AI, then they'll focus on the problems of those 1%. And the rich, you know, the rich get richer kind of a deal and something like that. So it's a very, what you're saying is very important that we need to diversify AI education, access to AI, uh, make it more uh, widely available. And I must say the community is trying uh, to do it. And it's something that, but more effort should be made, clearly, clearly, very important. But the fact that the discussion is happening is even more important, right? That is true, that is very true. And thank you for all your kind words and thank you for reading up on our research. <laughs> it's, it's really nice. I'm supposed to be doing that. Uh, thank you so much for talking to us and uh, really hope that we have a very uh, fruitful relationship with uh, AI for Social Good and the Centre as well as your uh, team. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you.